the altars of men. Um, and uh, last week, it's a bit, bit heavy, a bit of a, like a punch in the gut kind of sermon because the scriptures, the scripture was intense. It's saying, lay your bodies, give your bodies as a living sacrifice to God, holy and acceptable. We saw how Paul was using terminology of the burnt offering. And so this is me laying down my life. We, we offer ourselves on many different altars in the world, but we're in the kingdom now. And I understand that the wonderful thing is God is the one who is acceptable. That's the only altar I'm going to lay myself on. It's going to be a sacrifice to God, laying my will down, laying my life down. And in doing that, we understand that as we decrease, Christ increases. Paul said, it is not I that live, but Christ that lives through me. And so that is a wonderful thing. That's where true joy and victory and peace is found. Less of me. I'm my biggest problem. More of Jesus living through me. Okay, so we're going to move on to the next one. And this is the altar of service. So again, looking at when the Apostle Paul uses Old Testament terminology uh, to give us an understanding of New Testament living. So Philippians 2 verse 16 to 18. Here's what he says. Holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. I'm actually, I haven't got it up here, but I want to read verse 15 just to give you a little bit more context. So he says that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. That's what we exist in. Among whom you shine as lights in the word, holding fast the word of life for so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Yes, and if I am being poured out, here's where he's using that Old Testament terminology here, poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. For the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me. During uh, or coming to the end of the whole kind of COVID period, though COVID still exists um, there were moments that I remember seeing in media where uh, someone who's possibly in ICU um, suffering with COVID and breathing and stuff like that and um, it was like their discharge and so they would kind of make this guard of honor all the nurses and doctors would line up and they'll be clapping the person as they leave the hospital or I think they rang a bell or something like that and so you know what, what an image that imagery kind of stays with me and it came to mind when I was thinking about uh, this text they're rejoicing because their service was to see another person recover that's why they're rejoicing they that we served you for the benefit of your health not my own health to see you. so here's the day we remember when you came in and we had you all the tubes and sedated you and the ICU and all the intensity of that situation and here you are you've recovered and, and you're going home this is the sentiment of the apostle Paul in our text for him to see other people living for God to see other people fulfilling God's will for their life for him to see others holding firm to Jesus through this life and then they themselves going on to serve others, he says, it causes me to rejoice. He says, when I see that you are becoming blameless, harmless children without fault in the midst of this crooked and perverse generation, as he's seen them shine like lights in his word, as he sees them holding fast the word of life, he says that I may rejoice in that day or rejoice in the day of Christ, the, the day when Christ returns, uh, because he realizes I have run not in vain. I, my labors, all my serving, all my efforts uh, have been worth it for your benefit. He says on that day, on the day of Christ, when you join him or we join him or they would join him in heaven, he'll stand there and he would give his own applause. You know, scripture says we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Now, it's a little bit of mystery of well, who are these witnesses, uh, but it, just imagine it's the saints of old. That's why the scripture says you better run because there's many people who have sacrificed uh, and served uh, so that you can, you can live for God. It's the sentiment of our text. It's what New Testament Christianity looks like. Um, consumer Christianity is what I'm going to call it. Has a focus which is on self. The Bible, Jesus teaches, love God, love others as you love yourself. Puts you last. God, others, self. 
Biblical Christianity so focuses, centers on God first, then others, then you. The scripture says that you may uh, uh, not seek after your own needs, but, but other people. We're going to look at all of these texts. Hold on, I'm, I'm going ahead of myself. The mark of growth and maturity in a believer is that your Christianity goes beyond what God can do for you and what other people can do for you. But how you, but then it should be, and how you can be in service to God and in service to other people. The scriptures are pretty much big on this. Galatians 5 verse 13. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. First Peter 4 verse 10. As each one has received the gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Mark 9 verse 35, and he sat down, called the twelve and said to them, if anyone desires to be first, uh, he shall be last of all and servant of all. He again says, if you want to be great in my kingdom, then you need to be the servant of all people in my kingdom. All the writers of the epistles, the letters that we read in the New Testament, would often introduce themselves not as apostle, not as pastor, not as bishop. You know, today we're very big on these titles, bishop, apostle, prophetess, prophet, da, da, da. But, but to be more biblical, they would introduce themselves as bond servant. You do not see a conference title with bond servant. <laughs> New Testament, we're talking about biblical Christianity here. This is how they introduce themselves. The idea was I am saved and I am in service to God. Jesus said himself in Matthew 20, verse 28, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus is the greatest leader of all time, like obviously, but he so is. I, I really believe a great uh, example of, is, of his great leadership is he never asked us to do something he hasn't done himself. He says, before I ask anyone to serve me, I came to serve you, give him my life for you. And now we love him because he first loved, he loved us. He tells us to take up our cross and deny ourselves, but he's going to do it first. To be a Christian and to exist in a context of serving God and others would be very Christian of you. Sorry, I just find that sentence funny. The scripture praises his value and honor upon the servant. John 12, 26, if anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him, my father will honor. These are pretty good words here from Jesus. And so you get a couple answers. He, if anyone serves me, you want to serve him, you have to follow him. <laughs> and then, like I said, when you follow Jesus... When you walk in his steps, you end up where he is. So I want to be where Jesus is. Okay, then I've got to serve him, follow him, where I am there my servant will be also. If anyone serves him, then he says this, to him, my father will honor. That there is an honor that God places upon the servant. Now, come on, serving is, like I said, no one uses that title. It's not glamorous today. What do you mean servant? bond servant but but Jesus reveals to us that that's who my father honors many of, the, of his parables were to do with a master and a, a servant we know our bible hallelujah he says that's how my kingdom functions and he says to whom I'm trusting I'm going to entrust those servants who steward well but nevertheless it's, it's the servant there's a guy his name is Desmond Thomas Doss uh, I should have got his picture and so he was, uh, I think they made a movie about him, Hacksaw Ridge or something like that. And so he was an American United States uh, Army corporal. And he served as a combat medic in an, uh, in an infantry in uh, World War II. Due to his Christian beliefs, he refused to carry a weapon. He's in a war, World War II, no weapon. Uh, can I be honest with you? Yeah, I ain't doing that, man. I'm like, I'm going, you better give me some. <laughs> I'm just being honest, man. I, I wish I could be more like you, Desmond, but I'm not. <laughs> and so he's out there and people are shooting. And so you're the medic, which means you're 
right up where things are going down. It, you know, if someone got shot around the corner, I'm not trying to go around the corner too quick, you know. If someone just got shot, they haven't caught the person who shot them? No, they're still running around. Now, I ain't going around there. So he has to go to where people are getting shot. And so, and go and tend to them and, 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 and help them. And he has no means of defending himself. He's only there to serve others. This is this all I'm going to do. I'm going to go into the battlefield. And my job, my duty, and my responsibility is to serve. He was twice awarded the Bronze Star Medal for actions on Guam and in the, on, and in the Philippines. Um, thus further distinguished himself in the Battle of Okinawa by saving an estimated 75 men. And then I believe he received uh, this, this, I can't remember the name of this, uh, Medal of Honor, that's what it is. Like the highest medal you can receive in, in the military for that. They gave him the highest honor because he said 75 husbands, sons, uncles, brothers were able to go home because this guy served them. And he received great honor because of that. God says, I honor those who serve me. There's an honor in serving faithfully. I came across another uh, example of this. This guy worked in Burger King for 27 years. Never missed a day, never turned up late. After 27 years, Burger King gave him a goodie bag. <laughs> goodie bag. I don't know what we put in there, maybe some deodorant, toothpaste, tickets to the cinema, I don't know, man. It's 27 years, give me a little goodie bag. Never turned up late, never took a day off work. Man, man's faithful, man. And so the daughter was like, now nah, we ain't having this. She took a picture, video of him or with his goodie bag and put it on GoFundMe and said, look, what, look how Burger King honoring my dad. 27 years. Never turn up late, never, never miss a day. Faithful, give him a goodie bag. Yeah, I think one of them was a Starbucks cup. Starbucks cup. I would have resigned right there. But yeah, like I said, man, these guys are better than me, man. They're better than me, man. <laughs> God. But people were so moved by this. His GoFundMe page raised $400,000. Hallelujah. Faithfulness got rewarded, man. People were like, nah, you can't be doing him like that. I wanted him, man. Just to, Burger King should feel ashamed of themselves. There's an honor. God says, this is important to me. I would clothe myself in flesh, humble myself, and my posture when I come will be that of a servant. Destiny is intertwined with this. And so we had our Bible conference a couple of weeks ago. It was, it was good. There was a number of churches, couples that were launched into the ministry. Um, the commonality between them all is prior to that, they all would have been serving in their local church. Destiny is intertwined with with serving. Joseph excelled through serving others. He served his father, he served Potiphar, he served in the prison, and then he still served, he served Pharaoh. He was always a servant and it excelled him into destiny. Moses, prior to him uh, leading the children of Israel, he led Jethro's flock, he served Jethro. And then God upgraded him and says, now you're going to serve me and lead a nation of people. Joshua served under Moses before he led the people into the promised land. Samuel served under Eli. David served under Saul. Elisha served under Elijah before he took his place. The path of destiny looked like at least there being a season where they were serving someone else. I'm trying to make serving look glamorous again through the Bible this morning. One who serves faithfully makes themselves intrinsic to whatever establishment, team, organization they're a part of. If you serve, the, 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 the service position in football, excuse the football illustration, if you have no interest in it, but you live in a country that worships this, so you should always have something. The central defensive midfielder is the servant role. There's no glamour, there's no glory, Makalele. You don't know, you know about Makalele, man. Just that guy, he just cleans up, he mops up, 
He did. He gives it to everyone else gets the glory. So, and that guy would get picked all the time. First name on the team. Why? Because he's a servant. Anything you're a part of, if you are a faithful servant, you become one of the most important players. People miss you when you're gone. A smart worker will serve their way to the top. You serve well, you make yourself invaluable. You really make an impact. I remember hearing a sermon when I was quite new in the faith and a statement was made, you know, if you had to not be in your church, would it make any difference whatsoever? I sat there like, what? <laughs> it's like, hold on, how are you going to say that? <laughs> what our text shows us is that it's important, that it's honorable, destiny is intertwined with it, it is significant, significant before God. This is the mentality of the apostle. And he says, as much as it has all of those aspects, my real agenda and heart is, is for you. This is why he does it. It is sacred. He not only rejoices in that he labored or he is, that he has not labored or nor will he run in vain because of what God is doing in him, but he's also, of course, rejoicing over their sacrifice and service. So let's just dig into this text a little bit more. In verse 17, yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. So that Old Testament terminology is when he's speaking about this thing called a drink offering. This is a, a means or thing that he's pointing to to express the sacredness of serving God and seeing others serve God. He says, I am being poured out as a drink offering. Now, unless you understand what a drink offering is, that means absolutely nothing to you. I'll be honest, when I first uh, read that in, when I was reading the Bible, first started getting through the Bible and stuff, I think drink offering. Now, in hip hop culture, <laughs> there is something, uh, a symbolic gesture of pouring out a sip for the homies, the dead homies. And so when you see these guys in New York, wherever they have the brown bag, the sip, before they, before they take a drink, they pour a little bit out for the dead home. I don't know, the dead homies are absorbing it through the concrete. <laughs> well, my homies, drink offering. Okay, this is not, this is not that. It's not that. But that's what came to my mind. Some of you are like, yeah, I know that. If you grew up in the 90s hip-hop, you just know it. It's like, yeah. I think Tupac made a song, something like that. Yeah, yeah, there you go. I got confirmation. I ain't going to rap it to you. <laughs> I was tempted to, though, I'll be honest. In, in, let's get back to the term. In Roman culture, every meal ended with a small sacrificial ritual to the gods. A cup of wine was taken and poured out before the gods. And, and, and Paul is kind of using some of that, I suppose. But in his terminology, when he says drink offering, he's, he's, he's talking about this is a Hebrew man, right? And he's speaking about... Um, something that we see in the Old Testament. It is a sacrificial offering of wine poured out at the front of the altar to accompany a burnt offering. Ain't that interesting? So last week we were talking about the burnt offering, one giving their life. Now we're talking about one giving their service. And in the Old Testament, these two things went together. Numbers 15 and verse 5, and one-fourth of a hin of wine as a drink offering you were to prepare with a burnt offering or the sacrifice of for each lamb. And then verse 7 goes on to say, And as a drink offering, you shall offer one third of a hin of wine as a sweet aroma to the Lord. God sees that it is sweet to me. This whole one giving their life, and now it says, one giving themselves to service. Poured out is the idea of a complete giving with no reservation. The liquid is completely emptied from the cup, totally given to God. If you're not totally surrendered, if there's no burnt offering, you're going to struggle to present a drink one. Do you understand the terminologies right here? If I'm not willing to lay my life down, I'm not willing to be willing to really serve him the way I should. He says, I am willing to be poured out as a drink. Give, every, give everything I have on the sacrifice or service of you because of what you guys are becoming, because of the servants you guys are becoming, he says, I want to give even more. I want to give everything. The ancient Greek word of um, service is the word lutrogia. Lutrogia, that's it. Um, this means service to God or service to his cause. 
Instead of pouring out a cup, he's willing to pour out his life on this altar. He says, it's my offering to God. We can serve many things in life. But when one is devoted to God, his kingdom, his cause, his church, his purposes, his will, the connotations in scripture are that of that kind of service is sacred before God. It means something to God. He values it. It is a sweet smelling aroma. Matthew 10 verse 42 says, And whoever gives one of these little ones a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple, assuredly I say to you, he shall no means, by no means lose his reward. I love that. God, he just says, you just give a cup of water. You just serve someone in the smallest way. He says, and I recognize that. I'm telling you, you connect that people. You're storing up things in heaven for yourselves. Amen. Amen. Matthew 25, verse 4, he says, And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch you did it for me. Now, you understand the context. This is the sheep and the goats, right? When Jesus says, when I was naked, you didn't clothe me. When I was in prison, you didn't visit me. When, when I was hungry, you didn't feed me. And they're like, when did we ever see you in prison, Jesus? Like, what would you be doing in prison? You're Jesus. Like, come on, man. And he's like, no, 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 no. When you did this to the least of these. He says, you did it for me. Hebrews 6 verse 10 says, for God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown towards his name and that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. That word minister literally means to serve. The question is this morning is that am I willing to pour out my cup before the Lord? Many would want the glory that comes with it. Many would want the honoring that comes with it, but many don't want to do what it takes to get it. We just want glory and honor and position and status and get us to do things. You know, you, you give them, some people their mic, they, they're obsessed with a microphone. They just want it. They just want to hold it. They just want to, just want to stand here and say something. So, okay. They just, that's where their value and validation comes from. But, but God's like, you want glory and honor. He says that comes through serving. And he says, and that glory and honor is not coming from anyone else. The glory of man is all right. But when God will glorify and God would honor, that's, that really is something. There's this thing called, I've mentioned it before if you've been around a while, called stolen valor or military, yeah, a military imposter. Uh, so this is where uh, people dress up as if they're like uh, in like military, if they're military or they're like a veteran and they'll put all these medals on. They never earned none of them. They've never signed up to the military, not once in their life. They don't know what any, and they're, but now, now I get it. In, in English culture, maybe in certain towns that are a bit more patriotic, you might get kind of recognized, but especially in America, this happens a lot. Uh, in America, I'm like, if you turn up military, you get on the plane first. People clap you and salute you. And you know, they're very patriotic. They're very, they're very much about that. And so, uh, so people will do it to get the glory and to get the benefits that come with it. And there's companies, they were like, nope, the meal, you don't have to pay for the meal, it's fine. Da, da. They're sitting and never, 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 never signed up. <laughs> and so this is like a big campaign of ex-military personnel who are like just anti this. It's just disrespect. Like you didn't serve. Like we went through things. And here you are, you just want to put on this show like, like you did it and get that glory and that honor that you, you just didn't serve for. And so there's one video that I, I just found hilarious where the guy's coming out of church. It's coming out of church, the house of God, <laughs> amongst the assembly of the believers. Come on, man. The word of God, you should have, as the preaching of the word was going forth, you should have been taking off all those fake medals. <laughs> so you understand, you've got to understand, he comes in, think he would have been honored in there. Oh, we got military, we got general corporal, whatever his name is. Stand up. And all of this. And the, so he comes out, and then these guys, they catch him. And they said, oh, man, we see you got all these ribbons. But he did, there's a certain way you're meant to tie them on your uniform and stuff. And he realized, like, this is not, it's not poker. This is not how you're meant to do it. And he had, like, all these big major stars and blah, blah, blah. Like, yo, what did you do? What was you doing? Turn off. You know how people stay. Don't even put one or two, you know. Man had, like, a good two, three rows. And so they were like, what did you do? And he's there. First of all, he doesn't get it. Like, so he's just there trying to think they're impressed by it. He goes, yeah, 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 I served blah, blah, blah. Afghanistan. I served in Iraq. I served blah, blah, blah. And then they said, well, what did you do? And he goes, oh, to earn all these, I was saving lives. Saving lives. It's like saving lives, yeah. That's, that's it. That brother wasn't saving no lives. So they expose him. And he actually starts to run away. 
Once they just start asking like real questions that if you was military personnel, you would know. He starts to run away, he starts to think, and, and all he was trying to do after that was saving himself from his own lies. Not lives, from my lies, because I don't want to get exposed. Why does he, why does he did it? He, 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 he's all about himself, but puts out this image that he's really about others. Christians, we can, we can play this, this game. Where we re really and truly, I'm, 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 when push comes to shove, I'm actually about me. Because this is why he says the sacrifice and service. So some people get the some Christians, we're smart. Okay, serve, glory. But when you start to introduce sacrifice, then it's like, no. It's not going to happen. I'm telling you this, you get it, you get it. We, if we develop, you know, if some of our young creative people um, rise up in this and we develop another evangelical concert ministry. Again, that would be lovely, by the way. Um, and we start packing out the place, right? Start packing out venues and people just coming out like, oh, this is amazing and stuff like that. When people get on the stage, these are Christians. We don't get on the stage, they go, like, it's all about Jesus. It's not about me. I just want God to be glorified tonight. And, you know, just don't look at me. Please don't. Just look at Jesus. Like, no one said we're looking at you, by the way. But anyway. You know, no, 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 glory to God and all that. Come on, there's Christian lingo. You always get it, man. Everywhere you go, you know, it's really just not about me. Okay, now we're going to hear like 15 of my songs and my first song, I'm going to play it over and over and over again. So, okay. So, my old cynicism helped me. Jesus help me. Been around too long, guys. My problem. And so, yeah, you say, they say that, but if you're the one organizing it, right, and then they come and then you tell them, you know what, da -da -da, we have to reschedule, you're not singing tonight you start to realize that it really was all about you. Because they're going to be very, very upset. What do you mean I'm not singing? Of course I've got to sing. Da, da, da. No, it's okay. My presence of God is here. People are having a great time. Da, da, da. There's other ministers. They're doing their thing. We just don't need you tonight. So, you know, it's okay. You will see that person kick off. Because we like to make a pretense that it's all about other people. Really, it's, it's all about me. You know, unfortunately, over the years, I've been, you know, we've been like 2011 been here. There's, there's been a few times where I've had people come and say, I really feel God wants me to serve here. And I'm like, thank you, Jesus. We need servants. Hallelujah. On praise and worship. I said, okay, well, you can sing. That's fine. So I know what's serving nursery. <laughs> no one's ever done that. I just done, I'm just thinking about it. Now, no one's ever come and said, yeah, I just feel like I need to serve. And we, in, in your crash. And I'm like, but then we would check you, <laughs> CVS, all that kind of stuff. But do you know what I mean? Like, or ministry, there's no one desires. No, it's, it's always platform, it's always expression, my gift, my talent. And there's no problem with the gift, talent, etc. But as soon as I start to realize that there is a sacrifice that you have to practice, and we do meet, like, we want to be able, we, we're open three times a week for anyone who wants to come and just experience God or whatever. Maybe they were busy on Sunday, they can make the midweek, whatever. You know what I mean? We want to be there ready for them. And you just start to introduce a couple of those things and unfortunately you never see them again. I'm like, what did I say? What did I do? Sacrifice. Service. Glory. They made that correlation. They get it. They get it. But this part I don't want. I don't want to be poured out. But it's the pouring out that really makes it sacred before God. They fail to realize that when it comes to serving in his kingdom, I stand before an altar of God. And my life is poured out to him. It's what makes it, uh, it must makes, it's what makes it sacred. The kingdom of God, any, zoom that in, kingdom of God is big, but you zoom it in, any local church, it functions on the sacrificial service of people. It's our, but, but here's the thing, in, in the individual, in the servant, it has to be their offering to God. The Apostle Paul says near the conclusion of his life in 2 Timothy 4, 6-8, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time, so he's using that terminology again, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Finally there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not to me only, but to also all those who have loved his appearance. He's telling his son in faith, Timothy, I've given everything. That's wonderful. He says, I'm ready, just like, like the last part of my life, I'm ready. The man stepped into eternity knowing I gave everything for the will of God. That's powerful. It looked like a life being poured out before God for others. Leonard Ravenhill, uh, 
It's like an old revivalist preacher passed away, and he speaks about uh, John Wesley. Um, John Wesley is the guy who kind of spearheaded the Methodist Church, the Methodist revival, and as a big heritage and history here in the, in the West Midlands, in the black country. He speaks of him and he says, John died in 1791. He got saved at 35. He preached for 53 years. And you know what he left when he died? Uh, he left a handful of books, a faded Geneva gown that he preached in all over England, six silver spoons somebody gave him, six pound notes. Gave, give one to each of the poor men who will carry me to my grave. And that's all he left, six pound notes, six silver spoons, and a handful of books, and a Geneva gown. And there was something else. Well, what was it? Oh, the other thing. Oh, I know something else that he left. The Methodist Church. Oh, wonderful. I love that guy's preaching. <laughs> He's like, that's also what he left. Gave it all. God honored it. The question is, for us, we're looking at our lives. We're looking at what, what does Christianity look like biblically? How much of my life is being poured out? Is my life being poured out before my God? How much of my life is given to serving him and to serving others? The scripture says that you do everything as unto the Lord, not unto men. And everything I'm doing, I'm doing it, God, to the standard of you, of what you deserve. To do this, you've got to have a heart to serve. Something's got to occur in your heart. I am bringing this to a conclusion. The Apostle Paul, the writer of our text, he asked two, he, he, he asked two questions um, in a conversation he has with Jesus at his conversion that set the course of his Christian life and how he was going to live out his life before Jesus. I believe he never stopped asking these two questions. And I believe that we should ask these questions and never stop asking them. Let's, let's look at them. If you know your Bible, you, you remember this. Uh, Acts 9, verse 5 to 6. Jesus appears to him on the Damascus road, and he said, who are you, Lord? Who are you, Lord? So that's question number one. Lord, I want to know who you are. That's a question you always got to be asking. I want to know you more. Right? Okay. Jesus said to him, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against a goat. Okay. Against the goat. So what Jesus does is he gives him a little scrape of who he is. I let you know what my name is, right? You recognize who I am, right, my followers? And I'm going to let you know what you're doing. It's hard for you to work against me, Paul. That's a little, little scrape. Paul, we went through the book of Colossians. You remember that? Okay. Then he starts to really dig into who Christ is because he's grown in his knowing of him. But Jesus is going to give him a drop. I said, come, come know me some more, right? So I like this. So he trembling and astonished said rightly so he's standing before jesus right he asked question number two lord what do you want me to do lord who are you lord what do you want me to do these two these two questions are like the premise of this man's walk and he continues to ask it now look at jesus's response the lord said to him arise and go to the city and you will be told what you must do. I'm only going to give you the next step. I'll give you my name and the foolishness you're doing, and I'll give you the next step. Keep asking these questions, and I'm going to reveal more to you. Who are you? Philippians 3. So in the same letter to the Philippian church, in Philippians 3.10, he says, that I may know him. Oh, it's good. See, he's like, God, I, I met him. He told me his name and where I was going wrong, and I got my heart right with him. But even now, and so he writes to the church in Philippi from prison, right? This is way later on in his faith. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death. He's still asking. He still wants to know him more. And in that growing, in that revelation of knowing Jesus, I believe he continues to say, what would you have me do? And I believe God will continually give him the next step and he will continually obey. If we're going to be a people in service to God, if our faith is to go beyond what God can just do for us, but what he can do through us and how we can help others and how we can serve him, these two increasing revelations must be birthed out of an earnest prayer and a real and sincere desire that, Lord, I want to know you more. 
and I want to know what you would have me to do. I'm telling you, that, that kind of prayer, God will do something in you. He'll do something in your heart. He'll unveil your eyes uh, that you would have a desire within you to pour out your life in service to God at this altar. There is more meaning, I'm concluding, there is more meaning and more fulfillment uh, in serving others than serving yourself. You just have to grow a little bit to know that, but many people, they live their whole lives serving themselves, and they're very, it's a very small life. Um, but people really, you step into this. There's more meaning and fulfillment in living to serve other people. Seeing people get saved, seeing people get converted, seeing people grow in God, seeing people go into destiny, nothing, it never gets old for me. I know from, you know, see people make the right decisions for God, powerful. To conclude one's life having lived in service to God, I believe, is a life that truly went beyond oneself. And it's not only has implications here and now, but I believe it has implications also in eternity. But most importantly, I want you to know God sees it as an offering to him. That in his word, he, de he declares that he honors, that he values it, that he even works it into purpose and into destiny. And he is not slack in rewarding it. My final statement. There's some precious words that I believe many believers would desire to hear when they stand before Jesus, either in his return or when they step into eternity. Into eternity. You know what those words are? Well done, that good and faithful servant. That's, that's all I want to hear. It's like, it's pleased, like, well done. I saw it all. The little things, the incident, the only way, it, it was for me. Paul says, my life, he uses this, I'm concluding, he uses this Old Testament picture of this thing being poured out before God. It's amazing how all of these things, the, the reality of what they meant, the significance of what they meant, we see revealed in the New Testament. Because the preacher just pours it out. He's just following an instruction. Like, no, 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 and poured it out. And Paul was like, no, 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 these are all types and shadows. He says the real thing is that people's lives are being poured out for God in service to him and in service to others. This is the altar of service. Let's bow our heads, let's close our eyes in respect to God and the person next to you. We're going to take a few moments to pray.